Good afternoon. Welcome to Washington. It is good to be with so many tremendous industry leaders from across the nation who are gathered here today. Uh, let me say, first of all, thank you for the work you do driving aerospace nationally. Aerospace matters enormously. It matters enormously to Texas. In Texas, there are over 150,000 good jobs that come from aerospace. Texas has long been a leader both in space and aviation. And I'm committed to ensuring that Texas remains long a leader both in space and aviation. Let me talk first space and then we'll talk a little aviation. On space, for a lot of years, I served as either the chairman or the ranking member of the Space Subcommittee, the Senate Commerce Committee. And so for the last 11 years in the Senate, I've been proud to author and pass virtually every major piece of space legislation enacted in law. The way it operated for a lot of years in the Senate is that Bill Nelson, the current NASA administrator, was a senator from Florida. Democrats trusted Bill and his judgment on space. On the Republican side, my Republican colleagues trusted me. And so Bill and I together would sit down and negotiate a compromise, and if the two of us could agree, we'd have legislation that could pass the Senate and be signed into law. One bill that Bill and I worked on together was the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, which was signed into law by President Obama in 2015. Bill and I then worked together on the NASA reauthorization of 2017 that was signed into law by President Trump. And then, more recently, Maria Cantwell, the current chairman of the committee, she and I worked together on the most recent NASA reauthorization that just passed into law. You know, I have to say it is a testament to the unique status space has enjoyed. Look, this is a time of partisan division. Everyone knows that. We have partisan bickering over virtually everything, including what time of day it is and what to have for lunch. Uh, personally, I'll take the Republican side of that, which is barbecue over tofu and sprouts, but you know, to each his own. Uh, and I will say in an ecumenical nod, I am married to a California vegetarian, so there's lots of room for diversity on a lot of issues. Um, but it is a testament to the bipartisan cooperation space has enjoyed that in this time of division, we've seen major pieces of legislation that I've been blessed to author, one signed by Obama, one signed by Trump. And now, most recently, another signed by Joe Biden. That's important for continued American leadership in space. All of us are proud that the very first astronaut to step on the surface of the moon was an American, Neil Armstrong, that when he took one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind, that our souls leapt with him. I have to say, as a Texan, uh, I'm particularly proud that one of the very first words uttered on the surface of the moon was my hometown, Houston. Houston, the eagle has landed. And I just found out, this is very cool, I didn't know this till about 10 minutes ago, that apparently NASA's softball team is called the Astros, uh, which I find spectacularly cool. Um, that leadership is important, and I think it's critically important that we maintain America's leadership in space going forward. I'm proud that we're gonna be going back to the moon I'm proud that in the Artemis project, that when we next land on the moon, that among those astronauts on the surface of the moon will be the first woman to step on the moon. That is powerful. Down at Johnson Space Center, I've been blessed to welcome new cadres of astronauts. I remember one astronaut who was a Navy SEAL and has a Harvard medical degree, kind of frighteningly badass. And the guy's an astronaut, makes all the rest of us feel completely inadequate. And I pointed out that when he was being newly inducted, I said, look, this is someone who can kill you and then immediately revive you and bring you back to life. So it's good to have uh, breadth. 
Let's talk aviation. When it comes to aviation, we need to ensure competitiveness and we need to ensure safety. Now, as all of you know, we have been now over a year without a Senate-confirmed FAA administrator. That is unfortunate. That was a mistake. The administration made a nomination of an individual who appeared to be a perfectly nice man who didn't know a damn thing about airplanes. That was a mistake. Ultimately, that nomination did not succeed and it was rejected by the Senate. Now, the administration then proceeded to delay for many months before naming a new FAA administrator. I think that's dangerous. I think we need Senate-confirmed leadership at the FAA. And the agency has drifted listlessly without that empowered leadership. We now have a new nominee, Michael Whitaker, that has just been named. With respect to Mr. Whitaker, I'll say this. It is critically important to have a qualified administrator in place, an administrator who is prepared to focus on safety because the number one priority of the FAA should be maintaining the safety of the flying public. I'm committed to giving him fair consideration and prompt consideration in the committee. But at the same time, I'm going to take a very hard look at his record. The development of Next Gen was a boondoggle. And I expect that he'll answer questions before the committee regarding his tenure as the chief Next Gen officer. Mr. Whitaker was also deputy administrator when the FAA conducted the bulk of its certification work on the Boeing MAX 8. And I will want to know more about his involvement with that work as well. I also worry about any backroom deals that may have taken place to secure stakeholder support for Mr. Whitaker. The FAA is first and foremost a safety organization with many constituents, and it's not a place for political agendas. Every decision at the FAA should be driven by facts and risk analysis and data. The place for politics is Congress, which brings me to FAA reauthorization. Now, let me tell you where things stand. In July, the House passed its FAA reauthorization bill. There are some good elements of that legislation, but it also failed to address important issues that the Senate needs to speak on. Now, some of y'all may have been in the committee room when we had markup on the FAA reauthorization bill. The night before, Maria Cantwell and I were up till nearly midnight negotiating a bipartisan agreement. And I will tell you, we're only, we're less than a year into this Congress, but to date, Maria and I have worked well together. We agreed at the outset the two of us would have lunch every three weeks together and find ways to work together. When we first sat down for lunch, Maria looked at me with some skepticism and said, Ted, we can beat the crap out of each other politically, or we can roll up our sleeves and work together. Which is it going to be? And I kind of laughed and said, frankly, Maria, probably some of both. I said, listen, we're adults. Are there going to be issues in the, in the committee that divide on partisan lines that are shirts and skins that y'all want to regulate the hell out of people and we want them to be free? Yeah. And we'll slug it out, and both of us are perfectly familiar with how to do that. But are there also going to be issues where we work together in a bipartisan way to pass pro-jobs, pro-growth legislation? Absolutely. And that's the reason people go and serve on the Commerce Committee. It's the reason I serve on the Commerce Committee. It's the reason I've authored and passed so many different pieces of legislation on space, because my number one priority in the Senate is jobs. What every one of you does is exactly what I'm focused on every day, jobs, jobs, jobs. 
And what I understand is that jobs, by and large, they don't come from bureaucrats in Washington. They come from the men and women in this room. They come from the private sector. They come from small businesses. They come from entrepreneurs putting capital at risk to meet a need. But at the same time, government can be very good at screwing it up. And so it is important to find bipartisan pro-jobs legislation that can move. As I said, the FAA reauth, we had a bipartisan agreement. We sat down for the markup. The bill was on its way to passing, if not unanimously, very close to unanimously, with a big bipartisan vote out of the Senate Commerce Committee. Unfortunately, what happened is that morning, Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, got unhappy with one of the provisions in the bill that Chairwoman Cantwell and I had agreed to. And he got unhappy enough that he called Maria that morning and expressed his disagreement in, in fairly unambiguous terms and directed that she pull the markup down, and she did. I think that's unfortunate. It's the only time in my 11 years in the Senate I've seen a committee chairman pull down a markup on the orders of the Senate Majority Leader. I still believe we will get an FAA reauthorization through. Now, it's not going to happen between now and September 30th. We've run out of time for that. So I think what is likely is a short-term extension. It's likely to be three months or six months. But I am hopeful, Maria and I had lunch again last week, and I am hopeful that we can work through the area of disagreement between principally a colleague of ours on the committee and Senator Schumer right now there at loggerheads. I'm hopeful that we can broker a compromise. If we do, I think this bill will move. We've got a lot of buy-in from members on both sides of the aisle. Uh, and it's important for aviation that we focus on safety, efficiency, and competition. Aviation is too important to get it wrong. And so I want to close the way I started by saying thank you to the people in this room, but I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story to, to, to wrap up. And this goes back to the world of space. So how many people in this room have seen the movie Hidden Figures? So it's a phenomenal movie. Um, when it came out, I took my two daughters, I took my wife, and I took my mom all to see it. And it was fantastic. We watched the movie, and it, it's, it's an inspirational story of the groundbreaking mathematicians, African-American women at NASA that played a pivotal role in America's going to the moon. And afterwards, I sat down and had a, a long conversation with my girls about the movie. And one of the points I made to them, which, which they knew, but, but I wanted to, to, to reemphasize, was that their grandmother, my mom, had been one of those hidden figures. The movie begins with Sputnik being launched and the space race beginning. And one of my mom's very first jobs, she came out of Rice University in 1956 with a degree in math. And one of her very first jobs was she was hired by the Smithsonian to help compute the orbits of Sputnik. And so actually my mom was there and I asked her, I said, so, so tell me, how was, how was the movie? How accurate was it? And my mom thought it was very accurate. Now she had been in the space industry and in, in computer programming in the 1950s, the movie set in the 60s, so she was there a decade earlier. You want to talk about two industries that were not historically welcoming to women. Um, and my mom said she thought the movie was very accurate. And I said, one of the odd things to a more modern ear watching the movie is that they referred to these women, these mathematicians, as computers. And I said, you know, we think of a computer as a piece of metal on our desk, not as a person. And my mom began laughing. Her first job was at Shell in Houston. And her title was computer. And in fact, she had a business card that said, Eleanor Dara, computer. 
and a very cool epilogue to that story is that I introduced legislation in the Senate to rename the street in front of the NASA headquarters, Hidden Figures Way. And what happened, it's actually quite curious, a DC city councilman, a Democrat, saw my legislation and said, this is a great idea. And so took it up in the DC city council, introduced the same thing and passed it in the DC city council. So if any of y'all go to the NASA headquarters today, its address is one Hidden Figures Way. And I was there at the dedication of the new street sign and both the DC city councilman and I, we both spoke. He's a Democrat, I'm not. But we both told that story and one of the things, and I told my mom's story at that dedication, but I said, look, at some level you might think, a street sign's not all that consequential. What difference does a little piece of metal on a lamppost make? But on another level, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, some little boy, some little girl is going to come to Washington and is going to come to the NASA headquarters and going to look up and see that street sign, or maybe it'll be a hologram by then. And they're going to say, what does that mean? And they're going to hear the stories of those pioneering African-American women at the dawn of the space age. That's powerful. And it's an example, one more example, of how I hope we will continue to work together to advance American leadership in space, to advance American leadership in aviation. That's what everyone in this room is doing, and so thank you.